Hi, this is Dennis with Second Chance Tackle. Today's pandemic project is going to be an Olympic reel. It was made in Japan in the late 70s, early 80s. This one is the Olympic GVO 13. It's a beautiful little reel. I, uh, I scratch my head sometimes. These pandemic projects that we've been working on, I'm trying to remember where I got some of these. So I don't know if this was a flea market lot or where it was. However, it's it's mine and uh, probably needs to tune up. We got all kinds of dirt and things. I'm sure it wasn't the major reason that I purchased it. Probably just sat in the crate for a little while and uh, its time has come. So I like Olympic reels. I think that uh, for the most part, they're very dependable reels. If you line these up, they're, uh, they kind of line up with the uh, Daiwa uh, Silver Series, the 4000s, for example. Uh, they line up with the Penn Silver Series, also made in Japan. They line up with the Ryovis of the time. And they're nice little reels. This is a ball bearing construction reel. Nice gold uh, flavor to it in terms of t uh, tone. And uh, we're going to go exploring. This is, uh, if nothing else, a, a tuition reel because I haven't been inside this one. So we're going to take it apart. We're going to show you how to service it, how to clean it up if it's needed, and how to uh, oil and where to oil and so on. And, uh, and we'll uh, get it back fishing again, which is what it belongs doing rather than sitting in the bottom of a crate. So um, it says ball bearing construction, it says manual or uh, automatic bail, which I guess means you can either put it back by your hand or just let it trip, which is what we were doing before. And uh, let's see. So I take the handle off. The handle's got a screw on this side, which is kind of a, kind of interesting. That's what you saw me looking at before. Most of the through handles have the screw coming out from this side. However, this has got the threaded insert. Kind of goes on like that. A little bit of a different thing to note. I'm going to take the spool off. We'll service the spool last. But you do that by removing the dry tensioner. And we're going to put all of that. You'll notice a couple of things. I have a protective glove on my hand. I also have uh, a clutch tray. It's the bottom of the milk jug where I put all of the pieces and parts that I take off. So uh, let's take off the case. These are three case screws here. So let's get on those. So folks ask me, and I, I get repetitive at times, but folks ask me if they could use a, uh, a manual uh, or a automatic uh, screwdriver when we uh, working on fishing reels, and I kind of, I discourage it, um, not to be a purist or anything, but I just don't like the torque that are in those reels. But I do understand that folks, uh, some folks don't have the hand strength and need it. In that case, I just advise you to be careful. You don't run into too many problems when you take screws out. But I've seen problems when you try to put the screws back in with the torque on those. So if you can uh, avoid that and if you need it, uh, just leave the screws short so that when you go to retighten them, the last turn or two is done by hand as opposed to the... Uh, automatic screwdriver, in which case uh, you should be safe, not risking to warp or crack uh, a side plate. Okay, there's three of these. I lay them on the table because I want to make sure that the screws are all the same size. And as it turns out here, they're not. Or are they? Now they're close enough. You may have a, uh, replacement screw but I'm going to note that the one that looks a little bit shorter came out of the top corner up here just in case I'm going to put that one off to the side in my parts bin just to leave it as a um, standalone okay three of them off the case should just pull off then and it's a nice clean reel inside it kind of sounded that way when we were working on this uh, main gear should be next main gear is clean if anything this reel is dry uh, that would be the issue here Okay, we have a, uh, a manual, um, kind of arm-driven uh, anti-reverse. It clicks into this rotor up here. And we have a crosswind block with a crosswind gear behind it. We have a bunch of dried grease on the side. So we're going to go take care of that. And it appears that, that, that this is a single ball bearing reel with the ball bearing being under the rotor up here. So we're going to want to take care of that as well. Nice solid metal construction. That kind of defines the 70s and 80s before the cases went over to a graphite and, uh, and things changed. Okay, 
I, uh, from time to time I recommend just taking your small parts if it was a screw and just putting it right back into where that screw came out of. Uh, that way you don't lose it. Uh, I use a parts tray. Some folks like to uh, use a mat and lay the parts out in the sequence that they came out in. Uh, that's okay too if it works for you. That, uh, that parts tray in my memory has been pretty reliable for uh, some time now, so I'm going to continue doing that until I have trouble with that. Uh, but if you want to, if you have a different system that works, by all means do it. There's more than, than one system out there to keep track of what it is that you're doing. This is the crosswind gear. That's going to go inside. And then that's going to enable us to get up to the top. So the top is a 12 millimeter uh, nut, is what it looks like. I have a Mitchell tool that I use, but a deep socket uh, 12 millimeter will work from any uh, any manufacturer. And if you can sneak a wrench in there and you want to do that, go ahead. Most of these have this lip and makes the uh, the wrench a little tough to do. But if you can get the wrench in there and get it started and then do what I'm doing here, just turn the screw off by hand, then, uh, then go ahead and do that. Okay, we should be able to pull that off. We are. And I'm going to squirt down on the bail here on both sides. I noticed that I had a bail trip stickiness before, and I can see what's going on here. This bail is bent out around, and you can see there's a, uh, a problem here. There's a gap here that shouldn't be, and that's because the tension is forcing this out to the side, which makes the operation sticky. And what happened, uh, Probably, noting from where that bend is, it got slammed into a pier rail or something and pushed the wire over. These wires are very malleable. Uh, the last thing I'll show you is how to go correct that so that we have an easier bail trip. For now, I'm just going to flood the two points and let that go. There's one big old bearing sitting in there, and uh, we have a, uh, a little clip. Uh, I believe it's commonly called the snap ring. See if I can find my snap ring pliers. I wasn't prepared for that, but uh, I do have a snap ring pliers around here. Um, snap ring pliers has two points on it. I'm not sure if this one is going to be too big. Uh, this one looks like it might be a little bit better. So they have these two points, and the two points on the snap ring pliers can uh, can grip the two holes in the snap ring. We'll see if we can do that here. You can, and you can see how it pulls that snap ring out, and you can see where those two holes are. So you kind of need a snap ring pliers to uh, to service the bearing on this reel. I wasn't prepared for that, but that's what we got there. If you use that snap ring pliers, do what I did and hold it close, because that snap ring becomes a spring and it can shoot. With that there, we can pull it out then. We can uh, should be able to slide the bearing off. The bearing is a little tight. That's because there's a little stuff, debris, or what you want on the on the bearing track. And I'm going to just flood this, let some penetrating oil in there, loosen the grease, while I take some steel wool to clean that shaft that was a little bit tight in terms of um, letting that uh, bearing come back up. I'm going to check the threads here, make sure they're not damaged. And you also want to check the back side here. There's some grease in this channel. You can use a toothpick. You can use something like this as an awl. You can use a wire brush. You can use a paper clip. You can use, just a, you can use your imagination, anything you want to use, fingernails and, uh, and paper towels, whatever you want. But you want to clear that old grease out of here. And that was the one thing noted here, is there's a bunch of grease sitting on that side case there, which means that it wasn't, uh, this reel wasn't used for a while, it was stored because it all just kind of settled to one side and uh, eventually somebody just decided they weren't going to go fishing with it anymore and again I don't remember if I purchased this at a flea market or I don't know how I came into this reel I, I'll tell you it's probably been sitting in my to-do box for way too long and uh, this pandemic has given us the chance to kind of get to some of those projects so even if you have a reel out there I know more, most fishermen have more than one reel based on uh, what you're going fishing for and when. And in New Jersey here, we have quite a variety of fishing within the seasons, so we have quite a few different types of reels. Well, if you have that one that you don't use that much, but uh, you got some time on your hands with the pandemic, go ahead and take that one out. Kind of do what I'm doing here, clean it up and get it ready just in case it's uh, 
you're ready to go fishing, you get a run on a certain type of fish, and uh, then you know you're, you're set. Okay, so let's loosen that up nicely. Now WD-40 is not, um, not, a, not a good lubricant for fishing reels. It's good penetrating oil that takes, uh, takes grease and stuff off, but it's not really good as a lubricant. This is CRC Power Lube, and by lube it's, it kind of says multi-purpose lubricant. I go with a fishing reel oil. In this case, I'm going to use Relax. You can uh, you can use any fishing reel oil. It doesn't have to be particular to a product. Here's one from Okuma that I just found as I was going through uh, my little stash of everything. And uh, whatever it is that you use, make sure it's for a fishing reel. So here's what I said. I got a pile of, of um, dried grease sitting on the bottom here. That means somebody was probably storing this reel on a rod like that. And all the, re uh, you know, gravity did its work, right? All the grease just kind of worked its way to the bottom over time. And uh, probably when they went to restart, the reel was a little bit sluggish. Although it was operating pretty nicely when I just uh, cranked it out there. But it was probably a little bit sluggish because it had all accumulated to one side. And it was probably a little bit noisy because the grease was no longer on the gearing, but rather uh, just sitting in a rack and... Uh, that's kind of what happens. So I thought we had a bushing on this side. We don't. We just have the metal case. So the case is acting as a bushing here. That's always interesting because if that case uh, wears, then you're done. All right, this is very clean. I'm using um, cotton swabs just to kind of remove the excess grease. Well, there's more grease there than I thought. This is uh, a nice quality reel. I don't know what these things originally sold for. I'm going to put them in the same price range and marketing as I said with the, like the the Penn Silver Series also made in Japan the uh, Daiwa Silver Series made in Japan before the C Series replaced it made in Korea but uh, they were all happening towards the the uh, late 70s and early 80s they all seem to have that same kind of quality and I'm going to guess that they were all probably priced about the same all right so we've uh, cleaned off the uh, pinion gear We've got that bearing spinning nicely. We've got the channels cleared on that. I'm going to use some uh, real grease. Again, real is the important part here. Use fishing real grease. This is uh, Penn's grease. Uh, it's multi-purpose grease. If it's any real, just make, I don't care whose brand you use, just like with the oils, I do care that you use fishing real grease. Okay, when we do that, then we can load this down. And when you're loading, as I mentioned before, you want this anti-reverse dog in the off position. This one's going to intersect with the click ratchet here when it's, uh, when it's on. You can see it back there intersecting. Uh, you don't want that on when you're pushing down because you can force that to go uh, askew and you've got a problem. Okay, we're back to that silly click ring now, snap ring. I'm going to try and be careful with this and not shoot this thing to the next world. I like to, before I compress, I like to just find one side of that groove so that I can hold a finger and then compress on it. That way I know if it shoots, it's just kind of landing internally if I miss the, uh, the slot. I did miss the slot here, so I'm just going to push that down. At least I thought I missed the slot. There you go, I heard the click there. Okay, so we're, I think we're firmly in that slot. We are. All right, so there's the, the mounting of the pinion gear. When you flip the switch for the anti-reverse, now you can see the anti-reverse kind of hammering away doing what it would do. And just a drop of oil onto the pivot point below here will keep that thing rolling just fine. Let's go up and grab some of the other pieces then. We've got that crosswind gear in here. And it's got a little bit of debris on the back, so let's uh, get that old grease out of there. Now again, like the other ones, there's no burring or bushing or anything on here, so if that becomes elongated or uh, worn, uh, you're kind of out of luck, right? Just check here, make sure all the teeth are there and that they're in pretty good condition. Get some grease on a few parts of it. You don't have to get grease all over the place. And you do want to get grease on the face of this because that's where that crosswind block is going to ride. This is your crosswind block. We'll take a little bit of that extra grease off the sides. 
You want to make sure on the back of this crosswind block then that you get some grease into that little cavity where that stud is going to ride. And then you can place that going kind of straight up from the bottom. And then we'll come over to the main gear. So the main gear you want to get grease onto the stud which is going to go through the, the case. You want to make sure that the teeth that are driving the crosswind gear are full. Same thing with this. You want to make sure that the teeth on the main gear are clean, which they are. I didn't brush them off. I didn't have to. They're clean. But uh, And then you want to get a little bit onto the front here as well, which is going to go through the other side of the case. Once you've buttered that up pretty good, you can install that. And then we can insert the axle shaft. And that's the screw that we put inside there just to hold it. Put that on my table. Just going to use some steel wool just in case there's any coarse edges or anything. And just a light coating of grease. Don't go crazy on this one. Just light because if you go crazy when you go to put it through the pinion gear it's just going to all accumulate up top here because it's got a tight tolerance. Alright, we've got that part done. Let's go put the rotor back on. I did promise you that we were going to go fix that bail, so let's go do that. So I'm going to take that little screw before I lose that and put that back into my tray with the axle shaft. Now when you take a bail like this, if you have a problem with a bail, it's almost always that the tension on this thing is, is out of uh, sorts. And it's out of sorts because the bail got bent. Like I said, it probably got hit on a pier or a gun wall of a boat or something else. But you can tell that the bail is not operating properly or the wire is not set. If when you pull this sleeve out, it springs out. And you can see how that's sprung out. So what you want to do is just kind of follow the natural contour. You can see that it, it was, it was uh, injured, if that's the right word there. So you're just going to take it out. Just put a little bit of pressure to push it back that way. And then you just want to work to the point where it's more relaxed. It looks like I need just a little bit more of a bend there. And sometimes you have to bend the other side back down a little bit. And you want to work on the angles. You want to make sure that your, your angles are correct as well. So this is what I mean by more relaxed now. Now you're lined up with the, the arm coming straight down as opposed to it sitting out here a quarter of an inch or so. So we're, we're very close to where it should be. And that should function better. And you can see it's got a more of a natural curve to it here. If anything, that curve probably should belong over the other way. Just a little bit. I'm looking at how this belongs. So you can take your, your hand and just a little bit of pressure. Now I've got an even seal here. You can see how even that is as opposed to where it was before where it was, was kilt, tilted out. So that should help the firing of the bail. We'll only know when we put it back on and give it a test drive, but uh, that should help an awful lot in terms of how this bail will, will function. There's a little trip lever down here. Yeah, you can see right away just with uh, just the physical part of this. Just a quick trip, and we're not having any stumbling at all going on with that now. So that's how you, you fix a bail that's got a bent wire. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and put this back on. Grab that uh, nut. Now again, just like the front side of this, I want to put the nut on by hand as much as I can because I don't want to risk stripping that pinion gear's threads. If I strip it on a reel this age, I think that you're, you're probably out of luck in trying to find a replacement part. Then I'm using this tool, but again, you can use a 12 millimeter deep socket or you can use a 12 millimeter wrench if you can make it work in there. Alright, with that then, we're going to come back now. We're going to reset this point so it's low. I'm going to go ahead and put that uh, axle shaft in. I already put the light coating of grease. Again, the caution on that was the grease is just uh, very tight tolerances here. Right, you, you can see there's tight tolerances. If you sh put a lot of grease on it, it's just going to accumulate on there and eventually it's going to dry and cause you more problems. All right, we should be able to get that through now. All 
I'm going to pull this off. I got this crosswind block is up a little too high. I want to make sure that we're dead low again. When I put that main gear in and I started uh, rotating that uh, rotor, it uh, got a little bit out of sorts. So I like to make sure that it's all the way dead low. I'm going to hold that again. We'll do this one more time here. reason I'm having difficulty lining that hole up. Let's try this one more time. Let's try it with that. I don't think we need that in there. There we go. That's easy enough. <laughs> yeah, we, did, we didn't need that anyway. Most of the time you do, but in this case we didn't. Now we'll take that flat screw that we were holding. I want to grab my centering punch so that I have this circle clear. Go ahead and set the screw for this. And we can put that back case on now. I'm going to put a little bit more grease because the, the case is acting as the bushing. I just want to put a little bit more on there. Keep that well lubricated. Put the case back on. Now I had the one come out of here that just looked like it was shorter. It may or may not be. It may be a replacement screw. I'm not sure. But uh, if there is a reason why that screw might be a little bit shorter, then make sure it goes back in that same hole. There are manufacturers that do put short screws in certain holes because of case clearance and the like. So uh, that's why it's good to pay attention to where those screws are coming out of. Not all of them, not all the time. Much like that, um, that crosswind. Uh, block. Sometimes you have to pull the axle to get the uh, main gear out. Sometimes you don't. Usually just becomes a, a habit after a while of working on these that you always want to pull that cross line block off. In this case we didn't have to and uh, made reinstalling that axle a little bit easier. Okay and there's one more. Don't tighten them all down until you have them all pretty much in. You don't want again the case warping does happen does cause problems so just uh, stay even with it make sure that they're all pretty much seated and then you can go back and finish that last turner or so again at a mechanical screwdriver if you're using a battery powered screwdriver stop it short and do that last turn or two by hand there you'll uh, you'll thank yourself when you don't split a case okay we're on nice and tight there I'll take the screw out of the handle that we were holding there Oops, that, uh, that retaining washer belongs on the screw, not on the handle side. Oops, I'll screw the cap side. At, uh, this one is actually it's a nut as opposed to a screw, and it just went on the floor. We're having a lot of fun today with these things. So I'm proving I'm pretty human today. Another day in the shop. We did relocate that from my floor. Some folks asked what I have on my floor. I actually have a plastic mat that's uh, similar to the ones that they use for um, office chairs to roll on. And it's just fine that if I drop something, generally I can find it pretty quickly. However, I uh, stopped the camera for a moment there because I had to get off my chair and get a light to find it. And uh, here we go. Boy, that's nice. I, I like this reel a lot. One of the problems I have with fishing reels is that I have so many that I like that I'd love to uh, to keep for myself and go take fishing. But I have a few old favorites that just kind of keep going. And uh, there's no room really to just uh, keep a whole box of reels when they can go fishing again. That's the whole notion of Second Chance Tackle, get them out fishing again. So uh, if you... Uh, if you have more than you can use, get them out there, get them fishing is kind of the way I've been going. So, all right, we're just uh, separating these. These are Teflon, stand the test of time. They're strong, they uh, uh, 
take a beating and you don't need to do much with them. So we have, uh, just checking to make sure that I've got them all off. So we have a metal, uh, kind of a flex washer which goes in the bottom cavity and then we have a round keyed washer and then we have the first of the Teflon, an eared washer, a Teflon and a, a, a cap washer. Now there is a little bit of junk in here. Uh, so why not take the time to clean it? It's been sitting there for a long time. But you know those Teflon washers, you don't need to replace them. You don't need to lubricate them. They're a, uh, a plastic. So by nature, it's a petroleum product. And uh, it'll just kind of last. So uh, this, uh, this reel was built, built to last. I wish I could say the same about some of the reels today. All right, that little uh, flex washer went in first. And we had the keyed washer. And we had the... First of the Teflon, and we have the eared washer, which goes in the channels, like that. And another of the Teflons, that shiny bright one up top there. And then this little, uh, little clip, which goes in the ring to hold that assembly together. And hold that, it's a spring, it will shoot. <laughs> and I may uh, stop the video again and be on the floor looking for it if you're not careful. Okay, so that can just simply go back on. The bottom of the spool is nice and clean. I like this reel a lot. I, I really do. I wonder. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna do one more thing. If you don't mind me doing the dishes while I'm at it, I uh, have some purple power, which is a general degreaser. I noticed that there was a little bit of buildup of of salt or dirt or just plain uh, dust from sitting in the bin for a while. So I'm gonna just take the moment to to use that to clean that up. And while I have some of that on the uh, the paper towel here. Might as well just uh, go clean that drag knob as well. Make it pretty. All right, that's your Olympic um, reel. It's the GV GVO 13. It's a medium sized reel, probably in a 30 or, or 40 size class. It's from the late 70s, early 80s. It's a beautiful reel if you happen to find yourself in, in a position that, that you can buy one of these. Um, and uh, we've shown you how to take it apart and service it. And boy, doesn't that bell just trip so much easier now. And that's because we showed you how to, uh, to round out the, the bent bell so that uh, it can do that. So I hope you've learned something from it. I've certainly learned something from it as I've taken it apart and shown you how to service it. If, uh, if you have one of these and you, you're trying to service it, then uh, you should be able to use that step-by-step -step process to make it work uh, as this one does. If I have one of these and you need it serviced and you're a little bit timid or shy or just don't feel like doing it yourself and you would like it serviced, then send me a note to, uh, to my email, which is on the business card that follows this, and I'll be happy to provide you details on how I can service that for you. So uh, stay safe, stay well, stay indoors, uh, listen to uh, what we're being told in terms of best practices so that we can all get out of this pandemic on the other side sooner rather than later. So with that, I wish you a great day. This is Dennis with Second Chance Tackle. Thank you for watching.